generative AI is here and it has changed the rules of the game. Experts like Seth Godin and Robert McKee have been very clear. The authors who are going to make it in this business are those who are writing truly amazing, knock your socks off innovative stories. The bar is that high. AI will replace mediocre writers. But at some point, everybody is mediocre. So what do you do? You educate yourself. And the good news is that there's still time, but you've got to start leveling up right away. I'm Valerie Francis, and I've got a series of webinars to help you do just that. My specialty is helping authors like you put theory into practice. Understanding the tools of our trade and being able to apply them with precision is no longer an option. It's an absolute necessity. So go to valeriefrancis.ca slash webinars for more information and sign up for the notifications. You can't afford not to. If you want to write stories your readers will love, there are three things you need to do. Understand storytelling principles, see how other writers have applied those principles, and then use them in your own work. Here on the Story Nerd Podcast, our goal is to demystify story theory. We'll help you with the first two steps so that you can get started with the third. My name is Valerie Francis. I'm a writer and literary editor, and I focus on stories by, for, and about women. And I'm Melanie Hill, writer, editor, and poet, and I have a passion for spy stories, fairy tales, and master detective novels. On today's episode, Melanie pitched The Electrical Life of Louis Wayne so that we can study world building. This 2021 film was directed by Will Sharp from a story by Simon Stevenson and a screenplay by Will Sharp and Simon Stevenson. Of course, there will be spoilers because we can't talk about the movie without talking about the movie. And as always, we would love it if you could give the show a rating and review. For Apple Podcast listeners, you can do it right from your phone. Just go to the show's landing page, scroll to the bottom, click five stars. <laughs> it's that simple. All right, Miss Melanie, The Electrical Life of Louis Wayne. How did you make <laughs> out with it this week? Well, it actually... For the, for the purpose of what I wanted to do with it, it worked very well. But as a movie as a whole, yeah, it was, an, it was interesting. <laughs> You're so diplomatic. It is whack. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what's going on with this movie. <laughs> I know, I know. I just watched it and I went, oh, thank God I've got a very specific thing that I'm looking for in this movie because I think it, it does it well in some parts and maybe not so well in other parts but just watching it as if I was just watching it I think there would be a point where I'd probably turn it off <laughs> ah I was going to ask you did you turn it off at all or did you watch it all the way through no well I actually because this week was um a bit chaotic in my house I couldn't sit and watch it in one sitting so I had to watch it in portions um, because there was a lot going on at home, so which was probably a saving grace in a way, right? <laughs> so it wasn't that I was consciously going, I've, I've got to walk away and do something. I really only had chunks of time that I could watch portions of it. So it wasn't a conscious choice, but I was aware when I was watching it that if I was just watching it for pleasure and not for something that I was looking for, then, yeah, I think I would about halfway. I think when Emily died uh -huh. and just shortly after that, that's when I probably would have gone, oh, no, uh, no, I'm not interested anymore. So, yeah, what about you? Did you, because you might have had a different week, so did you watch it in one sitting or turn it off? I turned it off. I was mm -hmm. bored out of my mind. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm, I'm going to talk more about that when I get to my part, but I, I spent a lot of time after I finished watching it. I watched it all in one night. Yeah. Uh, just cause I wanted to get it over with. <laughs> which, which is just, Rip that bandaid. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Um, but after that first viewing, I took a day just to think about it to, f to figure out why I was having that reaction. What was it that bored me? Mm, was it a mm. subjective reaction or was there something else going on? So when I went back to watch it a second and third time, I, th it's then that I was 
doing my analysis and and looking to see not only about character development, but what was it that uh, wasn't working for me? And, and was it a subjective thing? Mm -hmm. Like, Mm -hmm. like a war movie is something that I would probably turn off uh, just because I find them so hard to watch. Mm -hmm. Yeah. War stories just to me, I just sob and sob and sob. So Mm -hmm. I usually need to, Mm -hmm. you know, put the book down and have breaks or put the, turn the movie off and have breaks. That's a subjective reaction. And I know that it could be the best story in the world, the, you know, the craft could be off the charts. Amazing. I would still do that because it's subjective. So I had to think about this one. Am I having a subjective reaction or objectively? Can I look at this and learn something from the craft behind it? And I think I have. So Mm -hmm. anyway, why don't you start by telling us about world building? (laughs) Well, yes. So the reason I chose this movie was because I wanted to examine how someone with mental illness is, or how their world is created and how does that mental illness get portrayed and how do you build the world of someone who is suffering from a mental illness. So, And that is a carry on or an extension of my theme for this season, which is examining world building in, for want of better words, the real world. Now, Louis Wayne was a well-known illustrator in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, and it is through his illustrations of cats that he actually shifted the viewpoint from the United Kingdom of, you know, cats just being mouses, and they became, after his whimsical and beautiful illustrations, they became more domestic pets. So it really, his illustrations had a really big impact on Um, the conscious of the countries and really, (laughs) which I I found amazing. I didn't actually ever think for one minute that cats were never really domestic pets because that's not the world that I grew up in. So I found that a really fascinating part of his, um, the consequence of learning about him through this movie. But it was also very well known that he suffered a breakdown and was committed to asylums for the last 13 years of his life. So that's why I chose this particular movie. But (laughs) I actually thought for, you know, considering why I wanted to study it, I thought it was a bit hit and miss um, with its depiction of Louis' mental state and his mental decline. But I do believe that what it gets right is there is a little bit of a use of his visual diaries to show his mental state and his inner turmoil, and that's introduced very early in the story. You know, there is chaos and decay in the early scenes when he lives in his with his sisters and the house is in a state of disrepair and there's a level of chaos with all the younger sisters running around. There is calm in his life with Emily, his wife, and the musical score really supports, I think, the the mental state of Louis by the with the use of the theremin and the musical score, and it's it actually comes up in the credits that they are um, instruments that were used. And when you listen to the musical score, you can pretty much hear it in nearly every every piece of music, and it creates an atmosphere, I think, which really reflects his inner turmoil or his inner thinking and emotions. The use of the um, metaphor of electricity is really good and consistent throughout the movie and it explains all the things, well, it's used as a metaphor to explain the things that Louis can't describe, which is basically his feelings and he doesn't know how to deal with his feelings. So electricity for him is not actually about the physics of actual electricity. It is a metaphor of his emotional state and and how he feels and how he receives feelings in his world. There's also his physical appearance. So he does become more disheveled as he sinks further into his depression. Um, You know, there's his sister's, his sister Marie. She's diagnosed with schizophrenia in the movie and she, and she dies. So that sort of mirrors and supports his own journey into depression and his, and his eventual breakdown. And then finally, some of the narration supports his decline uh, or his mental state, but not all of it. 
So a good example of the narrator explaining or helping us understand what's going on in Louis's head is the description, and I quote, um, Louis is like a frenzied bat in a burning oven. Louis's heart was a flapping mess. And so it's a very telling and very literal translation for us from the narrator to tell us what's happening but it's only good sometimes. So so what do I think um, the movie gets wrong or that I didn't particularly think supported um, the me- Louis' mental state or his mental decline? Well, again, some of the narration, right? So sometimes the narrator states the obvious and their tone is deceptively jovial, which I think deflects away from the meaning of the words that they're saying because the meaning and what they're actually saying in terms of the content is quite serious. Now, I think that contributes to the quirkiness of the film, but it's a case, I believe, of too much all at once and too much going on and and sometimes too much contradictory, too much noise. The narration doesn't provide clarity in some instances for the story to come through. Um, There's also Louis' ridiculous overreactions in some scenes. So, for example, when he goes swimming. Now, I I understand that it's meant to be comical, but it does, instead of treating what Louis is doing in a a way that supports or, or creates empathy for him, it actually does the opposite by making him seem ridiculous and odd, which there's nothing wrong with oddness but I think the movie t- does it too much and it, it, over, it over reacts to those sorts of things. Um, and then there's some of the visual effects that I don't think really go well because I think they're overused and I think there are too many different techniques being used in a sequence. So, for example, at one stage the point of view switches from us seeing Louis as a third-person observer to seeing what Louis sees. So it switches to first-person point of view. And the limited use of this comes in late in the movie and we see it once and it could have been used, I think, to much greater effect if it was introduced earlier in the film and then applied more consistently instead of some of the other more chaotic visual effects that, that, are, that are going on in the story at the same, at the same time. So what I found quite confusing were the dreams that Louis has and his anxiety around drowning. Now, I I get that it's used, these scenes are used to demonstrate Louis' state of anxiety, but there's no explanation of where that originates from or why it is that he feels that way. So that's incomplete to me. It would be good to actually have some understanding, again, to build empathy and to understand his his mental decline if we knew where that came from or if there was some sort of cause or if he's just an anxious person. I think that would have given us some explanation and would have made those scenes more powerful. Now, the financial state of the family is never good But Louis must have provided some earnings and supported his sisters and mother at some point. But again, that's never fully realised and never complete. So it's a bit piecemeal for me and so it doesn't quite work. And then there's finally Sir William and his gout. (laughs) Sir William is Louis's only real friend outside of Emily and his family. Um, it's not indicated at any point that he's suffering from health issues, but and then he just suddenly dies from gout. Um, and we don't know if that's relevant or not, or if it's something used for comic eff- comic effect, but it just it just didn't quite land for me. So they are some things that I found good, bad, and really I'm uncertain of. <laughs> now I'm going to dive in a little deeper into what what does work and what doesn't work from a world building perspective. And I'm going to leave the confusing points alone for for this week. Now, as I go through these points, I'm going to use the framework I've used before in this season, and that's to consider what fills the space in Louis' world and what what his subjective world is about 
and what fills his world from a sensory perspective and then how the viewer observes this world that they've never experienced before. Now, first thing, I'm going to go to the narration again. So the narrator has quite a few functions in this film. You know, it helps the audience when there are time jumps and it's and the narrator summarises events that are happening off screen during these time jumps. However, when the narrator states the bloody obvious or duplicates what the character says, it's annoying instead of enlightening. So, for example, the narrator tells us that Louis's father has died and Louis must take over the role of the provider. Carolyn also says the same thing shortly after the narrator says it. So I don't understand what the point of that is and I don't understand how that helps from a world-building perspective. But the narrator also gives the audience insight into the workings of Louis' inner thoughts. So, for example, the narrator explains how Louis controlled the chaos in his mind by always moving. So we have some explanation there. Um, Again, it's stating the obvious, but it also is probably stating things that we may not pick up with Louis's actions. So I do think that those kind of things help us understand the quirks of Louis's personality and his mental state, especially at the beginning of the story. I think also the playful and whimsical tone of the narration juxtaposed with the sometimes serious meaning of the word spoken is meant to create a level of cognitive dissonance in the viewer with an intent to build empathy with Louis because he's in a state of bewilderment himself most of the time. But, I, you know, I just don't think that works. <laughs> I just don't think that always works very well although that's what I think is trying to go on, what the narration is trying to do. But, yeah, it's clunky at best. Now there's the metaphor of electricity. And, again, the narrator opens the movie with a description of Louis's views on electricity. So she goes very quickly from the largesse of Victorian England to a very specific time of scientific discovery around electricity and then down to Louis's personal view on what electricity is. And like I mentioned before, he views it as the emotions and feelings that he can't necessarily describe himself. And then there's the changes in cinematography techniques and the visual changes in some parts of the movie, which I think are also meant to represent Louis's thoughts from the, you know, right from the chaos with his sister's to the glowing, warm saturation of time with Emily. And again, some of that is very clear as to when he's happy and other times when he's not happy. So some of it works really well and then sometimes it's just way too much all at once. Then another physical representation, I believe, of his state of mind are the houses and all the homes that he occupies because they are physical representations of Louis's inner life. And we've actually seen this quite a lot throughout the season um, with other movies where the home is very much a physical representation of our main characters' inner lives and the changes that go on in the home reflect the changes that are going on in the characters as well. But when Louis is at home with his sisters, It is crowded, it's messy, the houses are rotting, there's a lot of yelling and there's also a lot of diffused lighting. And by contrast, when he's with Emily in Hampstead, the light is very different, the house is calm, it's organised and it's a very happy place for them to be. So I find that really fascinating from a world-building perspective and showing how Louis's mental state is very different in those environments. And then after Emily's death, you know, Louis's home becomes a world of cats and, that again, the house is scattered with cat feces. It's, it's dishevelled. He's dishevelled. And his home stay, his home's physical appearance is very reflective of his, his inner state of mind. So he's clearly not coping. And then when his sisters come into his world again or directly into his world again, 
it brings again that level of chaos and the noise and the demands and the pressure that he has been removed from for a couple of years. So it's a very, I think that that's very well done in terms of the well building and the reflection of his inner and outer lives and how those external forces impact his, his mental state. And of course, then we go through a series of tragic events that all accumulate and contribute to Louis's decline in mental state. So, for example, there are there's Marie's diagnosis of schizophrenia and then a transfer into a mental asylum. There's Peter the cat's death, which causes Louis to weep without ceasing for several years. And again, that's told to us. We don't necessarily see that on screen. Considering that it is a large chunk of time, I would have thought that we would actually see him uncontrollably weeping as as time goes on. And then there's the combination of the acting and the narration. So there is a lot in this period, a lot of showing and telling, and it all builds to the inevitable, which is his his commitment to an insane asylum. However, at this same time and through this tumultuous period in his life, it's his emotional state that inspires his artwork and he creates prolifically. You know, and the narrator again describes how the memories of Emily and Peter combine with his emotion and they become powerful conductors of electricity and help him create all of those beautiful cat illustrations that, um, that, he, that he created in that time. And then that leads me to thinking about Louis's artwork, which is what he's well-renowned for. Now, it is not as prominent in the movie as it could be, and I think it could be used more, especially if it represents his mental state. So we are introduced to his anxiety early in the film when Emily goes snooping in his room and discovers his visual diaries and also the drawings that show her how torn he is internally. Now there is some suggestion that the more psychedelic drawings that Louis created happened around the same time that he was losing his grip on reality and succumbing to what at the time was considered to be schizophrenia. However, if this was the case, then the artwork could have been used more in the movie to show this. However, since Louis never dated any of his illustrations, it's actually difficult to tell if the more psychedelic ones were drawn during his less lucid moments. But again, you know, for the sake of the story that's being told, I do think that his artwork could have been used to greater greater effect and to support the, the world that he's in and his mental decline. And finally, as I mentioned before, there are times when Louis is having a breakdown and we see changes in the cinematography. You know, we see him ranting in public in New York. Now, the low point for Louis in the movie is during the crossing from New York to London on the ship. So this is where he's delusional and he thinks he is trapped in his cabin. There are misty images of a ship sinking um, and it appears that he's imagining that he's underwater and he has visions of Emily and Peter. And then when we come back to what's actually going on, when the steward finds him in his room and he's catatonic and he's, Louis is standing there, he's wet himself, there's water running from the tap, there are pictures and everything all across the floor and the cabin's in a state of disrepair. But the visual techniques to show that, again, they get the message across, but are they as good as what they could be? Oh, I'm not entirely sure. Now, this point in the movie marks the time when Louis' decline is actually skipped over. And again, we are told by the narrator about Louis' lack of luck, then more family deaths, and, you know, the, the continual things that happen and ultimately contribute to his commitment into the mental asylum. Now, for a movie about Louis Wayne, it is not really clear which part of his life the writers wanted to focus on. 
the disjointed way the movie focuses on events in his life, I found very frustrating. However, there are some specific ways the movie builds Louis's world that indicate and support he has mental health issues. You know, and of note, from a writing perspective, there is the narrator and what she chooses to draw your attention to and how she describes what's going on in Louis's head. There is artwork, in particular his visual diary, which is our first indication that he's aware that he is not always okay. And then there's the state of the homes where Louis lives and who and what they are filled with that clearly demonstrate when he's happy or in a state of distress. And then finally, there's a visual presentation of specific scenes in the movie and this includes the myopic views, the hazing of images of his losses, red flashes, glitching cats in the yard and electrical images after Caroline dies. So there are some things there from a world-building perspective that support his mental decline and how he sees the world in a state of distress, which, again, is why I was watching the movie and what I wanted to learn from it, but it's not perfect. (laughs) So, So, Valerie, what did you discover or did you discover anything about character from this movie, Louis Wayne? All right. Well, this is a weird one. I think we've established that. Uh, Before I get to character, though, I want to spend a few minutes talking about the story generally, because I think there's an important lesson here for us all, regardless of what kind of story each of us is working on. And Melanie, as I was listening to you do your part, I'm, I'm not shocked, but I'm still fascinated by the fact that you and I have picked up on so many of the same things. So here goes. Whenever I'm sitting down to study a film or a novel, the first thing I do is just watch the movie and I observe my own reaction to it, right? I I talked about this off the top of the show. Same thing if I'm going to study a novel. I just read the novel. I don't try to edit or analyze or any of that kind of stuff. So on the first viewing, you know, like I said, I could not get into the electrical life of Louis Wayne even though it's got a star-studded cast. I was totally bored. (laughs) Visually, it is interesting. It's a period piece, and I tend to like those. Plus, they use some interesting devices to try and convey what was going on in Louis's mind. Like during one of his mental breaks, there are psychedelic cat graphics on the screen. It's almost like a cat kaleidoscope. Uh, And Melanie, you talked a lot about this a, a minute ago. So Clearly, the filmmakers were trying to approach their project creatively. Thumbs up for that. And I would rather people try something and it not work than write something or or film something that is so safe that it's boring because it's safe. I'd rather we step out creatively and try something new, even if it doesn't work. The big problem here with The Electrical Life of Louis Wayne, in my opinion, is that it feels to me like the filmmakers forgot that they were telling the audience a story. It doesn't work as a story. Now, remember way back in the very first episode of this whole podcast, I said that if your story is about everything, then it's about nothing. Well, that's the problem with The Electrical Life of Louis Wayne. It hasn't decided what it's a movie about, and therefore it's all over the place. It starts out as a love story between these two quirky characters, Louis and Emily, played by Benedict Cumberbatch and Claire Foy. I mean, that is some serious acting power. And I enjoyed that part of the story. I I was engaged in that part, and it had some really good complications. For example... Louis and Emily are from totally different social classes. He's a gentleman and she was a governess. There was a significant age gap between them, although it's not brought out in the movie, but I did some research and and discovered it. She was 10 years his senior, which was a scandal back then. And listen, to be honest, it still makes tongues wag today. Also, Louis was the head of the family. He was the only breadwinner responsible for providing for his five sisters, and his mother. 
His family needed him to marry a rich gentlewoman, not a poor governess. So if they'd stuck with this love story as the focus, I think they would have been okay. But the movie is called The Electrical Life of Louis Wayne. So from the title, I would have expected them to focus on his beliefs about how electricity works and its impact on humans. And as Melanie said, how it's his way of trying to talk about his emotions. At the very least, I would have expected it to be a theme. Instead, it's introduced at the beginning And then it's kind of forgotten about during the love story part. And when Emily dies, it's picked back up again, but not in any coherent way. Like there's no connection between what we saw at the beginning before we met Emily and now this. You could argue, though, that this incoherence is the point. Louis Wayne is, after all, suffering from some sort of mental breakdown except that his state of mind isn't the main focus of the film. It's a complicating factor of his story. Weird, right? It was weird to me. So in my opinion, the filmmakers have fallen into the same trap that many memoirists and writers of historical fiction fall into. And it's this. They get so interested in the protagonist's life as a whole that they neglect to focus their story on one aspect of the life. What happens then is this, because we as writers are limited in the amount of space we have to tell a story, a film's about two hours, a novel's about 80 to 100,000 words. When we focus on a life as a whole, which is a huge big story, we run out of time and space in a novel. And we're forced to merely touch on the important bits. And then we end up having to rely on exposition to fill in the gaps. And that's exactly what happened here. They even have a narrator. Melanie, you talked about the narrator too. And the narrator is voiced by Olivia Coleman. You know, if anyone could pull off a narrator, it would be Olivia. And she's telling us things about Louis Wayne's life that we would rather have seen dramatized. So in The Electrical Life of Louis Wayne, here are all the topics that are covered in pretty much equal measure. Louis' mental health, Louis' extraordinary artistic skill, and the cats that he's known for. Louis' responsibility to care for his mother and five sisters, none of whom ever married, by the way. Louis' desperate and declining financial situation, and I agree with you, Melanie, They focused only on how bad it was getting, but clearly he had to have been bringing money in at certain points or he never would have made it to 80 years old or whatever he was. The film also talks about Louis' theories about electricity, which he doesn't understand is a metaphor for his emotions. He is dealing with it literally. And of course, as we've both talked about, there's Louis' love story and marriage, although this one does take up most of the first half of the film. Any of these topics could have been the focus of the film, and the others then could have provided color or depth or complication. Now, why am I making such a big deal out of this? Well, it's because I did not attach to the film or to Louis and his plight in any way. And really, when you think about it, he had an extraordinary life. The highs were really high and the lows were really low. And the Louis Wayne cats, as Melanie said, are hugely influential. I mean, I have this guy to blame for the fact that I have two cats right now who run this household. (laughs) So I should have been captivated. Instead, I was bored. And that boredom comes from the fact that I wasn't given the opportunity to emotionally connect to any aspect of his life. All righty, this brings me to my topic for the season, which is character development. I've been focusing all season on only one aspect of theory, and that is that a character is revealed through his action under pressure. Well, what do we know about Louis from his action under pressure? Unfortunately, not much, because the story doesn't stay focused long enough on any one topic for us to feel his pressure or draw any conclusions about who he might be. What we know about Louis, we know because either the narrator just tells us outright or 
one of the characters tells us through dialogue. Let me give you a couple of examples. Louis is the eldest child and the only male. So when his father dies, it falls to him to support his mother and sisters. We've already talked about this. Rather than letting us discover that he's not up to the task, the narrator simply tells us the following. In the 18 months since his father died, Louis had nominally become the head of the household. He was entirely unfit to shoulder these new worldly responsibilities, but as the oldest and malest of the six Wayne siblings, it had unfortunately become his duty. Far better suited would have been his beloved sister, Caroline, who had become frustrated with their rather whimsical and bohemian mother and stepped up at a young age to take charge as the family's matriarch. And as Melanie said, when the scene with the family and the sisters begins, Caroline also says, now that dad's gone, it's you got to do it. So <laughs> it's doing double duty. All of this information that the amazing Olivia Coleman told us would have been way more interesting if we had discovered it organically as the story unfolded. Another example is when Sir William says that Louis is brave and resilient. Now that caught me off guard because I thought, is he? Is he brave and resilient? When did we see bravery or resilience? We didn't. So it was weird. And also him die, suddenly dying of gout was weird too. That threw me off. I'm like, he's got gout? <laughs> All right. I'm going with the flow. Now, the last example I want to offer you is Louis's own monologue when Emily is dying. Here's what he says. This time with you, Emily, playing with Peter in the evening, sitting by the fire, these have been the best days of my entire life. I don't know why it is that I find it so very difficult just being on this earth, but I can say with absolute certainty that you have made it much, much better. You make the world beautiful and warm and kind. I just wanted to say thank you for that before it's too late. Now that's a beautiful monologue, but when was it revealed to us that he found it so very difficult to be on earth? In fact, the guy that I was seeing in this film was someone who appeared to believe and feel the complete opposite. Louis seemed to exist in a world of his own making. He was writing letters patent. He was writing operas. Not well, but he was writing them. He was boxing. He was jumping into a ring with a bull. He was asking the governess out on a date. If, for example, he'd been forced to give up Emily or he'd found a regular and well-paying job that he hated but did it for years in order to provide for his family, then we would have seen that struggle. Since Louis just tells this to us, even though Benedict Cumberbatch delivers it beautifully, it's... It's thin. There's nothing to support it. Nothing that we have seen is supporting this beautiful monologue that is delivered so well. And if you manage to get Olivia Coleman and Claire Foy and Benedict Cumberbatch working on your movie, holy Hannah, you better give them a good script. That's all I have to say about that right now. Anyway, all of this to say that I think while Louis Wayne, the man, had an extraordinary life, and while the filmmakers really did, I think, make an effort to be creative in their delivery, the electrical life of Louis Wayne, it doesn't work as a story. And because of that, even the extraordinary talent of actors like Benedict, Claire, and Olivia cannot rescue it. And yes, I'm using their first names. I'm just that audacious today. <laughs> so what we've learned this week in terms of character development is what not to do in my opinion. <laughs> All right, Melanie, uh, what do you have for the action step this week? All right. So today's action step is if you have a character that is mentally ill, I want you to think about how you are showing their mental state internally and externally. And I want you to consider how does the character's world help them or hinder them in their mental health? And that wraps it up for this week and for this season. That means that next week, Melanie and I will do a roundup of everything we've learned in the past 10 weeks about world building and character development. 
To support the show, please leave us a rating and review and tell your writer friends about us. For access to writing templates and worksheets and more than 70 hours of training, subscribe to my inner circle by visiting valeriefrancis.ca slash inner circle and follow me on X Twitter, whatever it's called now, and Instagram and threads at Valerie underscore Francis. If you'd like to get Melanie's tips about books to help you read like a writer, visit her on Facebook and Instagram under Melanie Hill author and find out more about her at melaniehill.com.au. And remember, story theory does not have to be difficult. It's a tool to help you write more, not less. So take it one step at a time and have fun. Mm-hmm.